I've heard someone ask, is, what's a Cisco? What's a Cisco? Yeah, a lake you, showed a, you showed a picture of it. Also called a lake herring. It's a corrigonid. Um, I want body with a Latin name. Is that okay? It's Cisco or lake herring? It's a bird, right? Pardon? Is it a bird? No, no, it's a bird. Okay. okay. It's, a, it's a corrigonid. Uh, it's one of the herrings. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that answers that. Go ahead. Um, would these spiny water fleas show up in a normal bed for testing? Or are they in the top of the water? Or, or where, should, where should we look at the sample to see if they're uh, really Yeah, the, the D-nets are not optimal um, for the spiny water flea. It's typical an offshore open water animal. Its favorite hab habitat is the, the warm surface water or the transition zone to the cooler water. So it, those are called the epilimnion and the metalimnion. It's in that area, the thermocline and up. They will get blown in vast numbers to some shoreline areas, um, depending on the wind. So I showed those photographs, the few big accumulations on shore. Uh, but no, generally, uh, there are two kinds of sampling that have been done to track the spread. Plankton nets, like the young woman was using in the boat. Um, it's very effective to sit on, if, um, and you can build plankton nets out of a pair of pantyhose, and, and uh, we can have that discussion now. If you can build a wonderful pan, uh, plankton net for about five bucks, and, um, but if you go out on a lake, uh, and if the wind has been blowing steadily in one direction for a few days, um, if you go to the downwind, or even for a few hours, if you go to the downwind end of a lake and do a long horizontal haul, um, that's a very sensitive method to see if they're there. The other method that's been used, um, that tailspine that they have, that long tailspine, nothing else has that. And, um, and that will serve, uh, and, and Every animal only produces one in her lifetime. Uh, most of them are female, you know, like many wise water fleas they've given up on men as a complete waste of time. <laughs> and, um, but the, uh, and so that spine sinks to the bottom. And um, so they have been tracked by sampling the sediment of the, in the bottom of lakes and, um, and then filtering the sediment through fine mesh and then seeing if those spines are there. And that tells you that the lake has been invaded. But we, we do it with a series of hauls along a fetch, two hauls at each of five stations, and then we go to the where we see the wind is going and we do a long horizontal haul. Question in the back there. Any other hands up or questions? Okay. The photographs you had of like large accumulations, like the size of a softball, I, I find that almost unimaginable. But if it was in somebody's hand, if I yeah. had a handful of them, or if they accumulate on a beach and I step on them, I, I mean, you said no effect on people. You, Will I feel the pins? Do they go crunch? Um, there's a, oh, I have to remember his name. There's a chap uh, who worked at the MOE that has a cottage on Harp Lake. And, um, and every year when he arrives at the cottage, um, he jumps in the lake and swims across the bay, a bay and then back to his cottage. And one year he did that and he called me at the lab and he said, Norm, something's changed in the lake. I said, what do you mean? He said, I felt all these little things because I was swimming across the lake. And I said, well, Last year, the lake was invaded by the spiny water fleet. So I think there, I think you could feel them. Um, those two handfuls, that came from a drift net in the Rainy River that was designed to catch drifting whitefish larvae. And it, and uh, but they were downstream of a lake that had been invaded by the spiny water fleet. And big wall, you get big patches of the spiny water fleet being blown that will accumulate at lake outflows depending on the wind. Um, uh, and so a bi big patches were of these pulses of the spiny water flea were drifting down the river and being caught in these in fish nets. And so that's where that one handful came from. The handful that Dave Garden scooped up off the shore of Lake Erie, that was just strong winds blowing them all to blowing them all to the shore. And you said swimming you could feel them. In what way? Like is a shark pin prick or just things you was bumping into? In the Little water? tiny pricks. Nothing. I don't think they're dangerous at all. No one has ever been pinned, or no spiny water has ever drawn blood in a person. Um, so I think you're okay that way. Uh, they originally came from Europe, as you say. What controls are there? Oh, good question. Um, they initially came from the Ponto-Caspian area of eastern Eur of Eurasia, the Caspian Sea, the Aral Sea, the Black Sea. We have lots of invaders that came from that part of the world. Um, the reason they do so well over here is that the Black Sea has never been glaciated. It's hundreds of millions of years old, and it's gone through times when it was fresh water and times that it was salt water. 
and there's been big switches from fresh to salt. So all the animals that are indigenous to the Black Sea have very wide salinity tolerances. Um, now, but the only one that got to Western Europe millennia ago, um, before Europeans built canal <coughs> systems all through Europe, was the spiny water flea. So it's native to the Black Sea, the Aral Sea, but it's been in Norway, for example, for millennia, probably brought there by, you know, cavemen. And um, so, is it controlled there? Well, the assumption is it is being controlled. It's not necessarily, um, uh, it seems to have less impact there than it does here. Well, we're just doing a comparison right now uh, of a postdoctoral fellow in the lab, Noreen Kelly, um, who has the difficult job of spending time in Norway. <coughs> and uh, she's been assembling hundred, data from hundreds of lakes in Norway and comparing them with here. They're just as abundant over there, but they don't seem to be doing, the, they, have, they don't do the damage there that they're doing here. They would be controlled by fish, if you, uh, uh, but they have much simpler fish communities. Um, so there's just a corrigonid and a, and, a, and a char of some kind. Uh, we tend, a lake that would have 12 species of fish here will have two or three species of fish there. Um, so there does seem to be some uh, difference. It's very common that species that are not problematic in one area become problematic in another. And that's, a vi that's one of these theoretical ecology questions that Jim mentioned. Uh, the favorite hypothesis for why that might be um, is called, has, it, these things all have great names, it's called the great escape hypothesis or the enemy release hypothesis that, that animals, uh, you've got a small pool of healthy animals that survived the, uh, the trip over in the ballast tank and they don't bring their predators with them. They don't bring their native predators or their native parasites with them. And so the parasite load in the new area is much less than it was in the native area. Uh, and there are co-evolved predators, you know, in the, in the new area that fill the gap. And so that seems to be all that it takes for an animal that's not problematic in a native range to become problematic in, a, in an invaded range. Uh, we don't know what the long-term effects will be, but I will, will say that we've been watching it for 20 years in Harp Lake and there's no recovery in Harp Lake. They're still, they've still trashed the community in Harp Lake. Uh, Norm, you mentioned uh, the threat, uh, the biodiversity thing. Yeah. And uh, I'm concerned about our, our own fleas or Daphnia. Yeah. They're, they're pushed out of the... I'm thrilled that you're concerned about yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're pushed out of the top in the, the most productive zone. Is that by being consumed by the spiny water flea or that the, they can't compete? And then they go into less productive water. Both. Um, we have about, for the Daphnia lovers in the room, um, we have about seven um, common species of native Daphnia. Um, only one can take the spiny water flea. And, um, and we puzzled over that for quite a while. But the answer actually came from Martha, who's sitting here, that we should have known. Martha said to me one day in the lab, you know, we hate when we work with the Daphne and Mendoti because they're so fast. And um, we have trouble with those cultures because we can't catch those animals. It seems to be the smartest, the quickest, the brightest, um, or, or the most zipped up of the Daphne somehow. And um, so it turns out when you compare the swimming, the escape response of that one species of Daphnia uh, and the attack uh, speed of the spiny water flea, that that one species is the only one that's fast enough to get away. So when you look at, in Harp Lake, it's the only Daphnia left. In Lake Michigan, it's the only <coughs> Daphnia left. In Europe, the relative of it is the only Daphnia that co-occurs positively with the spiny water flea. So it looks like there's one of, this, of our seven native Daphnia that's pre-adapted to deal with the spiny water flea. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it also is a good vertical migrator, so it can survive, but in Lake Michigan, it, try, it tends to avoid the spiny water flea and swims down. So it's both a mixture, some of them are eaten, and a very few number of them uh, have changed, the, have induced migratory behavior, and they now avoid the spiny water flea, and that can have an enormous negative impact because their growth rates can fall by a factor of five if they have to spend all their time in cold water. So it's, it is a combination of both. One of my broader concerns for biodiversity of the Daphnia is the combination of calcium, I wasn't going to talk about calcium, but the combination of calcium decline and the spread of the spiny water flea I think are bad. Because um, I think that combination of, mul of those two multiple stressors uh, will be very bad for the spiny water flea. Because Daphnia mendoti can avoid the, uh, the, sorry, it will be very bad for the Daphnia. Daphnia. This one Daphnia, the quick one, it's named after Lake Mendota, Daphnia mendoti in Wisconsin. Um, it, it is fast enough to avoid the spawning water flea, but it has a high calcium requirement, so it's suffering from, uh, 
following council. Okay, Alan? I dry my eggshells. Oh, great. <laughs> crush them up and fling them in my lake just because I can. And I figure it helps to help. Is there any downside to doing that? No, but fling them in the watershed. Oh, I do that too. If okay, I that's good. Walk, I fling them like, you know, my husband makes them crazy. But, you know, no. Um, but I see no downside to to flinging your eggshells in the watershed. Um, the the idea of of adding calcium chloride to all of our roads inadvertently is it, it may be nice for the lakes, but the roads are right beside the lakes most of the time, and that doesn't solve the problem in the watershed. So, you know, we should do other things to solve the problems in our watersheds. But flinging eggshells, go to it. <laughs> <laughs> But crush them up really fine. Do they have to be dry? Uh, they crush better. No, they don't smell. Very true. Okay. Any other questions? All right. There being none, first I want to thank. Was there a question? No, I was going to ask it. Does anyone have any more questions well, for Jim? Good. Thank you for doing that. Okay. Does anybody have any more questions? Oh, there we do. Uh, how will the fish uh, digest? Process the spike water. Um, I, don't, I don't actually know the answer to that. In Europe, uh, they certainly do in lakes in Norway. Um, so I'll, ma I'll make as much as I know short. There are fish that are being killed by eating the spiny water flea. There are small fish that are just big enough to eat it. And there are these really sad photographs <coughs> of, um, published by Jim Ker uh, by Kerfoot. Charlie Kerfoot, of these poor fish with spines piercing their, their whole GI tract. So those fish are tremendously uncomfortable and probably will die from septicemia and things like that. So some small fish are probably actually killed by eating the spiny water flea. Um, the, there was, there are, fish have very different shaped digestive tracts and there was some early concern that there were parts of, that, that eating the spiny water flea was like junk food for fish. And so they might eat a lot of them, but not get a lot of benefit out of them. Those early uh, suggestions in literature don't seem to have panned out. And so there was, for example, a burst of growth at age in, in, um, in Cisco, in Lake Rosso, associated with the arrival of the spiny water. So corrigonids, like Cisco and like herring and uh, whitefish, seem to have no trouble eating, eating the spiny water flea. Um, uh, fish has to be about 8 to 10 centimeters long before it can eat them. but um, there seems to be no, no evidence that different fish communities can prevent the spread. Um, so we have lakes with, with both uh, lar large planktivorous fish communities in all parts of the water column and those lakes are still invaded. So we can't rely on fish to, pre to prevent the spread, for sure.